Thanks so much for the invitation. It's nice to be back to have so many boards. Um, so this is all joint with Morgan Weiler and it's been supported by the NSF. The NSF wants us to tell us, or wants us to tell when we have the NSF support and proves theorem. So um, I guess this is like the first time in my life that I've given a talk and there's already a paper on the archive that's already a year old, but I guess that's the joy of the pandemic. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanted to do was just state the results. And then I'll say a little bit about the rape dynamics of prequantization bundles and go into some details of sort of how we prove the main result and how we can show that the ECH differential is only going to count cylinders. So the theorem is that if you have a prequantization bundle that's three dimensional. This will be over a closed surface of genus G, and it has negative Euler class E. Then as Z2 graded Z2 modules, we have that the ECH corresponds to the exterior algebra of the base. This statement originally appeared in um, Ferris's thesis. And um, then, well, PhD theses sometimes don't have all of the details in them. So one of the fun pandemic projects that Morgan and I embarked on was kind of upgrading the, the ideas in Ferris's thesis to a uh, more rigorous proof. And then along the way, we were able to understand a little bit more what's going on with the ECH index and how does the grading on this side correspond to the grading on this side and how can we kind of extract some extra juice and say a little bit more about what's going on between classes here and classes here. So what we were able to show is that for each class gamma, which gives rise to a non-zero ECH class. This will correspond to some number from zero up to negative E minus one. And under this correspondence, we'll get that embedded contact homology of the prequantization bundle is going to be a direct sum over the integers over positive over non negative integers d and then the power of the exterior algebra that you take is going to be gamma plus negative e times d and this is as z2 graded z2 modules and then when Look at the class gamma, which corresponds to um, zero. You can actually upgrade this to a Z graded isomorphism. What is that in the, the letter? So the ECH is as a morphic uh, D. Uh, yeah, so a non negative D. So just basically trying to figure out what's going on with the powers here. So what is the exponent? Uh, Sorry. It's gamma, where gamma is going to be a number from zero up to negative E minus one. And here the E. Is a negative so order class. Some, so there's a gamma there, and that's the difference. 
This is the same. H1. So that was a class. Yeah, so it's a class in H1. And the class in H1 will cor you can it corresponds to some number zero up to negative e minus one. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, are you going to tell us what a pre-quantization bundle is? Yes, it's under this. Uh, I'll tell you what a pre-quantization bundle is in just a sec. Basically, pre-quantization bundles are going to be certain S1 bundles over symplectic manifolds that are contact manifolds, and then the derivative of the S1 action gives you the rate vector field. But then you kind of have to be a little bit more precise than that um, when you define it. And when you have a non-zero class, you can upgrade this to a relatively graded. And then these index formulas would fill up like two more boards and um, when I showed these to Michael's student seminar, it was discovered that while everyone appreciates the ECH index, it's better left just in the introduction to a paper and people who are interested can read it. Um, but somehow in computations of ECH, whenever you see talks about ECH, there's usually not a lot said about the ECH index. It's just kind of this magical non-trivial ingredient that's used in the definition of ECH. Um, and Morgan and I were really able to kind of spend a lot of time thinking about the ECH index, which is useful, I suppose. Okay, and I guess it's useful because we got, um, as a corollary, we have this computation of the stable and unstable parts of ECH. So for sufficiently large grading, and when the genus of the base is greater than zero, we have that the ECH of the pre-quantization bundle is isomorphic to Z2 to the F of G, where F of G is equal to two to the two G minus one. And this is basically coming from the binomial coefficient theorem, which tells you um, the number of generators corresponding to some ECH index condition. And the other sort of corollary that we get is when um, the genus is zero, and then you can just directly compute that the ECH of a lens space uh, this is the grading. So for sufficiently large Oh. For star, which is the grading on ECH, and you also need the genus to be positive of your base. Even grading is the zero. Okay. So basically, we can compute ECH of pre-quantization bundles. We can really pin down and say what the grading is. And somehow um, the upshot is that because we're seeing this exterior algebra of the homology of the base showing up, it means that there should be some correspondence between the curves that the ECH differential is counting and unions of cylinders that correspond to Morse flow lines over the base. So I'll say a few more words about that in just a sec. And that's kind of surprising because usually um, when you, well, okay, when you define ECH, it's typically not just gonna be cylindrical curves that you count. You can also have higher genus curves. You might also expect there to be curves with an arbitrary <laughs> number of positive or negative punctures. And it's so, it's kind of this like miracle that when you compute ECH of these S1 bundles that you just get something corresponding to the homology of the base. And this kind of is repeated in Fleur type theories over and over again. And this is maybe the like most um, souped up version of relating something to sort of more homology. So you're basically saying that you purely consider all curves, but then actually only you have to prove some uniqueness and then you conclude that you only have to consider like flow line cylinders? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll say, and I'll, that's like going to be the rest of the talk, basically. 
idea is going to be that we use a perfect Morse function. Perturb the contact form. And the filtered generators for ECH are of the form E minus to the M minus, and then we're going to have an H1 to the M1 up to H2G to the M2G, and then E plus to the M plus. And here the MI, which are corresponding to the index one critical points, these will give rise to hyperbolic orbits. And because of how ECH is set up, you're only allowed to have uh, hyperbolic orbits with multiplicity zero or one. And this forms a basis for the exterior algebra of the homology of the base. Under the map, sending a critical point to its Morse homology class. So, maybe, so what I guess I'll first do is say what a pre-quantization bundle is. Uh, a perfect Morse function means that um, when you have just a surface, there's going to be no differential. Other questions, comments? So the quantization bundle is basically a way of turning an S1 bundle over a symplectic manifold into a contact manifold. And you want the derivative of this S1 action to be the ray vector field. And so what you do is you set up your principal S1 bundle Y over your Riemann surface. More generally, you could take any closed symplectic manifold. Usually, if you're trying to do some kind of Fleur theory, you would take your symplectic manifold to be monotone to rule out some kind of bubbling. And then you're going to look at the principal S1 bundle, which has Euler class given by um, negative the cohomology class of the symplectic form on the base divided by two pi. You don't necessarily have to divide by the two pi. It's just a normalization so that um, when you look at the fibers of the bundle and those are going to correspond to ray orbits by dividing by two pi, we'll get that the ray orbits have period um, two pi. And then a connection one form for this bundle is going to be S1 invariant. And we'll have that um, when we feed in the derivative of the S1 action, which is this vector field X, we're going to get I. And so then if we want to turn, if we want to come up with a contact form for the bundle, we can just take I times the connection one form. And we also will have that the curvature is given by D of the connection one form. And that's just going to be I times the pullback of omega under this bundle map. Huh? And you need the like uh, symplectic form to be like rational cohomology class or something like that, right? Which is automatic. Yeah, but this will be automatic for a surface. Ah, for a surface. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the general post for the general manifold though. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what's automatic is that you find such a normal. Sorry? What's automatic that such an omega exists, but not every omega is like quantized, right? If we multiply by a constant, I guess. Well, yeah, you can multiply by a constant. Yeah. Yeah. 
And like for surfaces, I mean, you could just take the standard area form. Yeah, I mean, I'm just being annoying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so anyway, so I times the connection one form gives you a contact form. This contact form has X as the ray vector field. And we'll have that all ray orbits are degenerate. And have period two pi. And then what we can do is we'll perturb by a more male function H. We want the absolute value of H to be C2 close to one. Our perturbed contact form is just going to be one plus a small lift of this perfect Morse function times the original contact form. And then the perturbed ray vector field is going to be one over this quantity times the original ray vector field X plus um, I have a negative, I have an epsilon XH tilde over one plus epsilon lift H squared. And so the upshot is that using this perturbation, um, the only fibers which persist to be ray orbits of the perturbed contact form have to live over critical points of the lift of the Hamiltonian vector field. So they're going to have to project to critical points of your uh, Morse function on your base. And up to large action, the only critical points that, or sorry, up to large action, the only ray orbits that you have of this perturbed vector field have to come from iterates of fibers which project to critical points of the base. If you pick your epsilon appropriately, and the other um, ray orbits that you can have are either larger iterates of those fibers, or they can be, um, they basically live in the tori's that um, exist over the closed orbits of the Hamiltonian vector field on the base. And we have. I guess I can. So basically, we'll have that Tommy Zander index. So I'll use the notation gamma PK to indicate that it's the rave orbit which projects to the critical point P, and it's the kth iterate of that fiber. This is going to be the Robin Zalman index of the fiber. And then we have to subtract half the dimension of the base. And then we add Morse index of the critical point. And we'll take the constant trivialization. This will give us that the Robin Zalman index of the fiber is equal to zero. And so we'll get that the Conley Zander index with respect to this constant trivialization is just going to be given by the Morse index minus one. And so we have that if um, the index equals zero or two, this gives rise to an elliptic orbit E minus or an embedded elliptic orbit E plus. And then if the Morse index is equal to one, this gives rise to 2G hyperbolic orbits. And these are positive hyperbolic orbits, and their Conley's linear index is always going to be zero. So, I guess before I start to sort of blather on about why the ECH differential just counts unions of cylinders, I should say something about um, what embedded contact homology is and what are the ingredients that go into defining it. 
Um, Wait, so the index is independent of the uh, iteration number? Correct. If you use, so here we're using kind of the stupid trivialization where we're just taking the constant trivialization. So this is not sort of the standard way that you would trivialize if you were looking at um, S3 or a lens space. Right, right, right. So normally this would not be the trivialization you would use for the three sphere and for the three sphere, the Robbins Alman index um, would give you 4K for this term. But for the ECH index, we have because you have to compute a relative self-intersection number, and you also want to look at, well, that's the main thing. And if you want to try to compute the relative self-intersection number, if you use not the constant trivialization, it just becomes like a giant mess to try to compute. But normally in um, SFT or sort of cylindrical contact homology or symplectic homology, usually you would not use this constant trivialization when the genus of your base is on zero. Everyone happy so far? I mean, somehow this was like a very hands-on project where you can really understand the dynamics and you can really see what the generators are. You can compute the index and everything is very hands-on, which is always nice. So ECH, this is the flutter theory for three manifolds that's due to Hutchings. So for a non-degenerate contact form, the chain complex is C star. This is generated as a Z2 space at orbit sets. Alpha I M I, where Alpha I is an embedded rave orbit. That means in this example, it's just going to be the first time you have an iterate of your fiber. And then we have that the MI are non-negative. Well, okay, usually you say that they're positive. Um, and when they're zero, then you would not have an orbit set in your chain complex. And then you want the sum of MI times the, the class of the homology class of your rave orbit. You would want that sum to be equal to gamma, where gamma is um, an element of the first homology class of manifold Y. And then if alpha I is hyperbolic, then mi is equal to one. So basically, if you have elliptic orbits, then you are allowed to have your orbit set encode a certain amount of multiplicity. But if your orbit is hyperbolic, then you're only allowed to include one copy of it. So then the grading star comes from the relative ECH index. 
It's going to be between two orbit sets, alpha and beta. So alpha is going to be the sort of top orbit set, and beta is going to be the bottom orbit set. And then Z is some relative homology class. And this is going to be a combination of a relative first turn class. In Conley Zeger terms. And the relative self intersection pairing. So, if you like, you can think of this relative first term class as encoding something about the algebraic topology associated to um, the currents that you're going to end up counting. These Conley Zander index terms detect information about the rave dynamics or about the contact geometry. And then this relative self-intersection pairing is basically seeing something about the contact topology. And for this um, perturbation that we use, where the alpha and beta are going to be of this form here, it turns out that it actually doesn't depend on the Z. And you can actually compute this as the Euler characteristic of the base times D. This corresponds to the relative first turn class. Then we subtract D squared E. I guess that's a positive number because E is negative. And we add 2 dn. And this corresponds to the relative self intersection. And then we have plus m plus minus m minus minus m plus plus m minus, and this is the Kami-Zander index term. And here d is going to be equal to m minus n over the absolute value of the Euler class, and here big M is just equal to the sum of m minus plus m1 up to m2g, plus m plus and big N is similarly in terms of the ends. So here, alpha would be of the form where I've got ends, and beta is going to be of the form where I've got ends everywhere. Do you have some kind of... Uh... I don't know, intuition for why it wouldn't depend on Z, or is it just it, kind of magic? Or? It's basically coming from the geometry of the problem because your um, rave orbits are all coming from the fibers of this bundle. And when you use this more snail function to perturb, you are just getting orbits that live over the critical points. And then you can start to basically play games with which rave orbit sets have to live in the same homology classes. And that is basically fixed in terms of um, the difference between the multiplicities. So like if you kind of think hard enough about what's going on with all these rave orbits and what happens when um, alpha and beta live in the same, represent the same homology class, it tells you that it actually doesn't depend on the surface Z that would interpolate between the orbit sets. But it took us like 20 pages to compute the ECH index, so it's okay if it's not completely obvious. That's the ECH index. And I think in terms of like computations of ECH, we know it for the irrational ellipsoid. 
and our ECH. And then when you do the irrational ellipsoid, um, you can like do it in terms of lattice point counts where you realize the ellipsoid as a toric domain. And this ECH formula also recovers that lattice point count. It just recovers it from sort of the perspective of the pre-quantization bundle. And then the other ECH computations correspond to other um, toric domains. And typically for toric domains, when the ECH differential doesn't vanish, you end up counting curves that have two um, punctures at the top and an arbitrary but finite number of punctures at the bottom. Um, and I think really the only computations of ECH that exist are for toric domains and then pre-quantization levels. I was going to ask, what, what, is, what is tau? Everywhere. Oh, tau is a trivialization of the contact distribution that's constant um, at the ray orbit ends. And then we're going to want to define a differential. So that's going to involve an almost complex structure. This is going to be lambda compatible, which means that J is R invariant. Then J preserves the contact distribution. And then we want D lambda of V, J, V to be positive for non zero V in the contact distribution. And then we want J to basically act like multiplication by I, and it's gonna intertwine, intertwine the rave direction with this R direction. And the ECH differential is going to be a lot to count of um, ECH index one currents. I'll say what a current is in just a second. And these, these currents are going to be equivalence classes of J holomorphic curves. Which are asymptotically cylindrical to the orbit sets alpha and beta. So they're going to be asymptotic to alpha at plus infinity and asymptotic to beta at minus infinity. And disjoint unions of J holomorphic curves just means that um, I don't have to consider connected J holomorphic curves. I can have um, some disconnected J holomorphic curves. So you can have. And that looks like this. And these are your alphas and these are your betas. And then you've got destroyed unions of J holomorphic curves. And then because it turns out that ECH index one forces you to be somewhere injective unless you're a um, cover of a trivial cylinder, this is going to tell us that our um, occurrence, well, Basically, we can just think of them in terms of disjoint unions of J holomorphic curves and lots of these covers of trivial cylinders. And so when we have to consider the uh, covers of cylinders as currents, we're only going to care about their covering multiplicity and not about any of the other information.
passes because of a So what are the components of ECH? I mean, I told you the differential, I told you the chain complex, but then there's kind of a question of why does this weird ECH index thing actually force us to have a well-defined differential which squares to zero? So for this, I have two haikus and the theorem. Okay, and I guess the point of the haikus is then I could state the theorems in a not so precise way that is a little bit more understandable. So the first haiku this is the Hutchings in 2002. And this says for generic J, ECH index one. Yields somewhere injected. So this tells us that with the exception of trivial cylinders and their covers, the J holomorphic curves under consideration are embedded. Which basically means that except for when we think about trivial cylinders and their covers, we can conflate the notion of a current with a J holomorphic curve. But typically you can't do that. And then um, this in combination with compactness and a symplectic action argument will tell us that the ECH differential is well defined. And then the ECH haiku number two. This is due to hunting the towels. It's from um, 2007 and 2009. This says that d squared is zero and the obstruction bundle gluing is complicated. So I guess the statement of this haiku is a little bit more um, understandable and kind of the magic is that normally when you think about J-holomorphic curves in symplectizations, if you just consider Fredholm index one, that doesn't tell you that the curves are somewhere injective. And so somehow the ECH index one is really like a strong condition. And the fact that it tells you that the curves are somewhere injective unless they're trivial cylinders or their covers, that's like a pretty special thing. It's kind of the magic ingredient of ECH. You can kind of think of the ECH index as the sourdough starter for the theorem. And um, it's the only sort of reason why ECH works out as well as it does. For this haiku, um, what happens when you try to prove d squared is zero is usually you would look at some uh, sequence of ECH index difference two curves and try to see what it limits on. And it turns out that it's not sort of the standard gluing argument in um, FLIR theory. And actually, in order to prove that the ECH differential squares to zero, um, you have some top curve and some, you have some top ECH index one curve and some bottom ECH index one curve, and you actually have to glue in a certain number of covers of uh, trivial cylinders. And what's kind of magical is that um, there's a way to actually understand the contribution to that gluing problem in terms of obstruction bundles. And that um, number corresponds to some partition conditions relating to multiplicities of ray orbits and things. Um, and then the theorem, is due to Taubes, and this takes up 500 pages in geometry and topology. That's basically all of 
2010 number five. And this says that the embedded contact homology is actually independent of the choice of almost complex structure and the choice of contact form. But Taub says a lot more than just prove invariance of ECH. He also establishes an isomorphism between cyborg Winton floor homology and embedded contact homology. I and, think the independence comes from that isomorphism. Yeah, yeah, and the independence comes from that isomorphism. But there's no direct proof. There's no direct proof. <laughs> That you don't really understand what happens when you form data, like if you try to do it like uh, directly. Yeah, so what happens is that when you look in a cobordism, you stop having control over the Fredholm index. And once you stop having control over the Fredholm index, you have no idea what kind of like branch covers of trivial cylinders you would have to glue in to actually understand what the cobordism maps are. Yeah, you get a lot of crap. <laughs> and um, I think Chris Gehrig and um, Dan Christopher Gardner have spent like a lot of time thinking about how to try to come up with cobores and maps for ECH, and it just is a total nightmare. Um, And Jacob Rooney has, he proved some things about existence of ECH cobordism maps, but he was looking at very special perturbations of the contact form. I believe the perturbation of the contact form he was using was basically turning all the elliptic orbits into hyperbolic orbits. And then you could say something about cobordism maps, but that's because you basically get rid of all the elliptic orbits and the elliptic orbits are the ones that can kind of have interesting conley zander index contributions and that they're not always iterating nicely. Plus, once you get rid of all the elliptic orbits and you just have hyperbolic orbits, because the- hyperbolics with the same conley zander index. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's- I mean, because- uh, you can have hyperbolic. This. I think you turn an elliptic. Oh, this is not yeah, you turn the elliptic orbit into an elliptic orbit of twice the action, and then you get a negative hyperbolic orbit of the same action as the original elliptic orbit. And then, because in the ECH chain complex, you only consider hyperbolic orbits with multiplicity one, it kind of drastically simplifies your chain complexes. It's like a very kind of like special case to get cobores and paps. Because also like hyperbolic orbits are super rigidity and things like this. Um, basically, once you start having like orbit sets that include elliptic orbits, you have like no proof of anything. And this four generic J index one yield summer injective. This is. Okay, I shouldn't, okay, in 2002, this was only for simplexizations, and Hutchings did upgrade some ECH index stuff in cobordisms, but I don't think you have the same theorem in cobordisms. So it just becomes like a total mess. So that's kind of the ingredients that go into ECH. Um, and yeah, trying to understand what the ECH index uh, is for two uh, orbit sets is pretty challenging. And in the pre-quantization bundle, basically, well, I guess I erased my definition of a pre-quantization bundle, but basically for pre-quantization bundles, you have really nice control on what the dynamics are and how it relates in terms of multiplicities of a fiber. And you can kind of explicitly find um, the surfaces that you need in order to compute the relative self-intersection pairing and the relative first churn class and everything kind of like is relatively computable. Okay, so. I think that's like kind of all of the ingredients and now for saying what the chain complex is. And then for the last 15 minutes, what I want to do is basically talk a little bit about the ECH differential and why 
the ECH differential is just going to be counting unions of cylinders, which correspond to Morse flow lines. And because we use this perfect Morse function to perturb the contact form, which gives rise to these types of generators. And if we're going to show that these pseudo, if we know that the ECH differential just corresponds to um, unions of cylinders, which correspond to Morse flow lines, and we have a perfect Morse function, then we know that the ECH differential will vanish. And then we'll end up with the result that we want. But it's uh, one non trivial cylinder and trivial um, it, It's actually, well, it's disjoint unions of cylinders. They can be, you can have a disjoint union of, yeah, you can play around with these M minuses and M pluses so that you can have multiple non-trivial cylinders, but it just has to be a finite union of cylinders. I think, okay, so I think we, well, I don't wanna say we collectively, but there are some people in this audience that probably understand pseudo-holomorphic cylinders relatively well. So um, as Augustine, he generalized um, a construction by Seifring to hold in pre-quantization bundles and Seifring did it for uh, like trivial, S1 bundles and stable Hamiltonian structures. So this says that Fredholm index one and two pseudo-holomorphic cylinders correspond to Morse float, sorry, correspond to floor trajectories. And then uh, the classical results of Fleur and Salomon Zander. I've learned from Chris that he gets really upset when people call his results um, classical. So you're not supposed to say classical results due to Wendell, but I think it's okay to say classical results due to Fleur, Salomon, and Zander at this point. So this says that the Fleur trajectories on a symplectic manifold, which is monotone. Chris thinks that everything classical is before 1985, but I don't want to put more than just now. But then, I mean, I think really classical should be before Chris got his PhD. <laughs> no, I think classical before 2000 is like an acceptable answer. Um, I think it just makes Chris feel old when you say that his results are classical. Um, Well, this is kind of like a weird, well, this will show up in just a second. So we have that cylinder counts. You don't really have to think about the J that you use when you count cylinders. Um, and this is basically because of automatic transversality. So use of fiberwise S1 invariant J. This is true even for multiply covered trivial cylinders.
because multiply covered trivial cylinders isn't really important in the context of ECH because your multiplicities for your hyperbolic guys are always zero or one. We've got counts and then what's the next word? Permit. The use of fiberwise S1 invariant J. So basically, um, in order to invoke Augustine's result, you need to use uh, a J which is fiberwise S1 invariant. But if you were to pick a generic J, it may not be um, fiberwise S1 invariant. So I'll say a little bit about that. main contribution I would say of Ferris is actually seeing that this filtered ECH differential only counts uh, or only corresponds to finite unions of cylinders which project to more slow lines and that the higher genus curves don't, don't contribute. So the point is that while we can count cylinders using the S1 invariant complex structure given by just going back the complex structure on the Riemann surface under the bundle map. We cannot use this lift on higher genus curves. Basically the point here is that this almost complex structure cannot be independently, independently perturbed. Perturbed at the intersection points. of i, y, u with a given S1 orbit. U is my pseudo-homorphic curve. I can't do this with an S1 invariant perturbation. When you're a cylinder, um, you're not going to have, you don't have to worry about this issue because you're going to be fixed by the S1 orbit because you're a cylinder. So you have an S1 action already. So what you do so what you can do is you can use a domain dependent almost complex structure which is s1 invariant Write this as J Z sigma G Z in uh, sigma dot, where this is the domain of your pseudo holomorphic curve. You want to think of this as sort of akin to the time dependence in Hamiltonian Fleur theory. And then you can do basically a dimension counting argument once you have regularity to say that you don't have a contribution to the differential from your higher genus curves. So basically, you'll have transversality because you've used a domain dependent almost complex structure. So you're going to be able to achieve transversality for your ECH index one curves. So your transversality will guarantee that ECH index one curves do not exist unless they're fixed by the S1 action. 
domain of the curve u? Um, sigma dot is the domain of the curve u. Okay. And, and sigma g is the sigma g is referring to the fact that we want to take this S1 invariant almost complex structure coming from the lift of a complex structure on the base, but we're going to do a domain dependent perturbation. So there's a z, and then we're looking at the z parametrized by the domain of our pseudo holomorphic curve. So sorry about all the sigmas. Action. And the point is that otherwise the curve lives in a moduli space of dimension at least two. But the ECH differential only counts curves where the projection for the uh, y component is isolated. So this means we only count the disjoint unions of cylinders which project to the floor trajectories. So it's this, um, it's basically a dimension counting argument and you also invoke the uh, ECH index inequality, which basically tells you that the ECH index is bounded above by the Fred Holm index. And then the remaining issue that you have to deal with is that when Hutchings set up the definition of ECH, which I've since erased, you're using um, a generic S1, you're just using a generic almost complex structure, which is lambda compatible, but you're not using um, a domain dependent almost complex structure. And so you have to relate um, basically what happens if you use a domain dependent almost complex structure to what happens if you use a domain independent, almost complex structure, you just use an arbitrary generic J. And the reason why you don't wanna use an arbitrary generic J here is because you're not going to be able to easily say that the higher genus curves don't contribute because you can't use these kind of cute um, dimension counting arguments. And so then you have to consider a one parameter family of J's um, and then in order to show that you're not going to actually impact um, ECH, you have to kind of classify the types of curves that can appear um, when you're looking in this one parameter family. We relate these counts using a one parameter family of J's. Where starting J is going to be one of these domain dependent S1 invariant J's. And then our ending J is going to be just an arbitrary um, regular lambda compatible almost complex structure. And then the main lemma that you have to prove, which uses um, a little bit of obstruction but ruling a little bit of the um, compactness arguments that Michael and I used in an earlier paper, and then some refined asymptotic estimates of Christofaro Gardner, um, Boyu, and Michael. Obstruction when we're doing no crutchings and tubs. So this says four generic paths 
space. We've put out transversely, say for a discrete number of times. And for each one of these times, the CH differential can change either by the creation or destruction of a pair of oppositely signed curves. or something called an ECH sandal slide. So the word handle slide is meant to indicate that the homology is unaffected. And so it actually doesn't matter that we use this domain dependent, almost complex structure, which is S1 invariant in order to actually say that the ECH differential is only going to have cylindrical contributions. And um, for whoever's interested, I can stay a little bit and say um, a few words about what goes into the proof of this one. So I'll end here. So does this lemma say that the count is the same as if you count only cylinders or that you actually get in the, for the standard J's on the cylinder? So what this is saying is that, oh, okay. So one point that I didn't say is that actually, if you want to use a domain dependent, almost complex structure, you can only consider, um, domains which are stable, and so cylinders are not considered stable, and so this is only going to work for your higher genus curves. And so what this lemma is basically doing is it's saying that it's valid that you use this domain dependent almost complex structure to look at ECH index one curves, which have higher genus, and to use this dimension counting argument to rule out their contribution to the ECH differential. Okay, but if I was using like the standard non-domain dependent, so the domain independent J, right. I might have contributions, but the count would be zero. That's what it's saying. Um, this equivalence via this. Yeah, it was saying that you might have contributions, but then when you pass to homology, the homology is the same. So it's basically like, a, it's kind of like when you want to prove invariance of um, homology and like Hamiltonian Fleur theory or any of your favorite like Fleur homology theories. So it's like, it's not a, it's not a constructive argument. It's just a statement saying that it didn't actually matter which type of J you used. And huh? one understand the result that it's the exterior algebra on the homology. Can one understand it uh, from uh, higgard fleur homology? Um, so it, 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 it looks very suggest suggestive. It almost yeah. looks like you, you, it wants to be like the homology of the symmetric product of sigma. And yeah, so it, it so does. It's a simple argument, at least heuristically, why it should come out in terms of higgard fleur um, I don't know one for higgard fleur but I know for periodic Fleur homology, um, you have that the, I think it's like the degree D periodic Fleur homology for the identity is supposed to correspond to the D symmetric uh, product of the homology of the surface. And then you know that the homology of the, or the symmetric product of the homology of the surface is isomorphic to the exterior algebra of the homology of the surface. And then for that, you're looking at commutative 
monomials, and those are not going, you can only repeat um, monomials which have the index zero or index two critical points corresponding to the elliptic guys. And then your um, odd degree index one generators can only correspond to the hyperbolic orbits. But that's not the perspective from Hagard Fleur. That's like the weird periodic Fleur homology perspective. So I don't, I don't know enough about Hagar Fleur homology to say why that result should be true. And I think yeah. and Hagar, what's kind of like nice, I guess, about in the ECH case is that you have this like very explicit perturbation that you can use to understand the rabe dynamics. And then um, because of that, you can easily compute the ECH index, but it's not clear to me how to kind of get that result to come out like cleanly from Hagard Fleur homology, like what the right way to set up the chain complex computation would be. Okay, let's thank Jordan.